I'm at a private airport in Los Angeles, California with Gravity Industries, and this is a real-life working jet suit. I first heard of this company, Gravity, back in 2017, when YouTube graciously served me a TED Talk called How I Built a Jet Suit by a gentleman named Richard Browning. I followed Richard and his company closely for the last two and a half years, and I got invited to try his invention for myself. I'm going to tell you all about the jet suit, how it works, how to actually fly, and what Browning's plans are for the future of his company. As you can imagine, I was insanely excited. I had been thinking about this exact moment for over two years. I cannot believe this is happening. Oh my God. My brain is not processing what is actually happening. Sometimes dreams really do come true. This is insane. You can't exactly just strap on the jet suit and expect to be able to zip around like Browning and his team can. This takes time. Words like epic, insane, crazy all come to mind when I think of what it felt like to have that suit on. I could not process it at the time. I'll do my best to describe what it was like on that platform. First, you get strapped into a harness that attaches to the tether so you don't accidentally fly away or come crashing down. Then you put the suit on by sliding your arms into the arm mounts and strap the rear engine to your torso. The suit is pretty heavy, but hey, this thing literally makes you fly. I felt more badass at this exact moment than I ever had before. Going into this first attempt, I thought the trigger worked like a gas pedal in a car or a motorcycle throttle, meaning the more you push or twist, the more power you get, but that is not the case. It's more like a cordless drill that has adjustable power levels. It's basically off or at full power, but that max power level can be finely tuned. Gravity starts most clients at what is effectively 20 stops below full power in order to get used to the turbine spinning and distributing force. As soon as I pulled the trigger, I felt an incredible force from all three of those points, the engines on my arms and the one on my back. The force sort of makes you lean over a bit, similar to standing in front of a desk or countertop and leaning on it with your arms. The proper way to hover is to bring the jets up to full power and then vector your arms down, thus lifting your body off the ground, all while sort of leaning on the force the engines are exerting. But since this was my very first attempt, I didn't really know what I was doing, so I kind of just hopped around and felt the power. And what you see the pilots doing here are signaling to increase the power of the suit one nudge at a time. I had a brief chat with Richard after my first test flight, and he gave me a few pointers. I'll be honest, I wasn't satisfied with round one because I hadn't really achieved a proper hover. Round two, my focus here was on positioning my arms properly to achieve a hover. And this right here, this six or so second hover marked a pivotal moment for me. Feeling the tremendous power of the five jet engines suspend me in the air, even for just a few seconds, gave me an overwhelming sense of joy. I was really excited. It also really made me want to keep trying, but alas, a session on the tether lasts just two minutes because the jets burn about a gallon of fuel every minute. So as it stands, even untethered flights last only about two minutes. But that is not stopping Richard and his team from continuing to push the boundaries on what's possible for the jet suit. Here's what a jet suit consists of and how to operate it. We have five gas turbines. Two small jet engines on each arm. And then you've got a large one on the back and that's burning fuel, which then expands in, uh, into a gas, which turns the turbine. And that basically is just chucking a load of hot gas that way. So you are propelled in the other direction by wearing the suit. And all together, those three are like a tripod, like a camera tripod. And if you kind of flare them out, that means that all the force is going outwards. So you're not going to go anywhere. But as you bring those down, if you point them down, you're going to start to go up. You've got a control system, which is a trigger in the right hand arm mount and a nudge switch in the left hand arm mount. So you can control the max power of the suit and the trigger is just for you to bring the power all the way up to full power for your body weight. While you're training, the best thing that we want to see you doing is holding those engines at full power out like that. And you'll be wrestling the thrust a little bit, but you should be able to stand there and stay still. Then, like exactly what you're doing, you vector down, and at that point, you're propelling that gas down, so you're going to go up. Good thing about this is rather than relying on the throttle control of the engines to adjust your height, 
Because you're running at a constant power, you're throwing that thrust using your body. The thrust is augmenting your body. So that's why we have the most minimal amount of kit possible. Like riding a bike, you become one with it as, as you're cycling along. You don't really think about riding the bike. It's the same thing with this, but in many more dimensions. So it's much more dynamic to fly by just throwing your arms around than it is controlling a throttle. So this is the main control board. This is what converts your hand controls into a signal that the engines can read and so they know what kind of level to go to. For each engine, you've got an engine control unit behind there. There's one behind there, one behind there, and then the, the one for the rear engine up, is up there as well. And you've got these micro GSU ports, which is for this, which is our kind of ground support unit. So this is how I can kind of I can plug into any one of your engines and spool it. All of the suit is 3D printed. It's 3D printed in aluminium, which you can see there. Those are the shiny sections and uh, nylon. And then we have some 3D printed steel on the back. This is black coated 3D printed steel. And that is actually the ballistic protector for that rear engine. Same with these aluminium sections here. Uh, you can see around the turbine blade, we've actually got uh, the aluminium, then a layer of Kevlar in here, then another aluminium layer on the top. So there's a starter motor for each turbine that kind of kickstarts it and then it will inject a load of fuel and then there's a glow plug in there that starts off the kind of the combustion process and from then on it's kind of self-perpetuating. Now, let's talk about Richard Browning. Who is he and what's his background? And why did he build himself a flying machine? Did he just wake up one day and decide to do this? Take me to uh, sort of what you were doing prior to this being a part of your life. Um, and was there just kind of one day where you woke up and you were like, today's the day I'm gonna go buy a jet turbine and put this thing on my arm. Um, what was your life like then? And what was that moment of decision-making to purchase one of these? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, another good question. So uh, actually the majority of my kind of normal career, if you like, was uh, as an oil trader. I used to work in the city of London. Uh, I used to, you know, actually buy and sell cargoes and move ships around the world. I used to do some interesting business development traveling around, but nothing, you know, that exotic. That, that was quite an interesting, challenging job. Um, I spent about six years in the British Royal Marines Reserve alongside my day job as well. And my whole, and I'm giving you the ingredients here of the rationale, my whole family history was from the world of aeronautics and engineering. So one grandfather, uh, Sir Basil Blackwell, used to run the UK's main helicopter business. My other grandfather was a wartime pilot and civil pilot as well. And my late father was uh, an aeronautical engineer and maverick and in de designer and inventor. So I think a lot of that all has always been there. I've always loved making and building and breaking things, you know, when I was a kid and that never really went away. I, I probably chased in the end the oil industry job because uh, it was interesting and challenging. I love the deal making side of it and the meeting interesting people around the world. Uh, but you know, it, it paid very well. That somewhat liberated me over the years to gradually have the, I suppose, the freedom of mind, you know, the financial freedom as well with my family to start doing more and more interesting things. And I mean interesting in the sense of when you see a challenge and you think, I wonder if I could do that, like getting your Green Beret in the Royal Marines. Uh, you think that would be really cool if I could do it. I'm not really sure if I can, but if I can, it would be super cool. And I did enough of those things in the early part of my life that I got used to the fact that probably four out of five times when I have one of those ideas, it doesn't work out and you have to live with a failure. Um, and then every now and then, it, the one success in those five makes all the failures worthwhile. That's very much that innovative kind of spirit. It's a tough journey, but the highs hopefully outweigh the, the frequent lows, if you like. So. Putting all that inspiration together, I had this idea that, you know, flight, human flight and speed and all that kind of stuff, you know, I, I love all that. What if you could support your own body weight? Like, like you know, we're sitting on this stage here now. That, that stage is exerting a force on our rear ends enough to keep us to hover on the stage, right? So if you swap the stage out for the momentary support of some form of propulsion, and that propulsion, rather than going up through your rear end because I'm sitting in a seat, rather than that, it, what if some of it was actually on your arms? Because you can move your arms so well. We're so good at being consciously aware of where our arms and hands are. What if you actually had the propulsion, some of it, on your hands? If I can lean forward and, you know, all this gymnastic stuff I used to do, if you can lean forward, uh, you know, in a planche type position and do that, well, surely I can just lean on those engines. So that, all of that was what inspired me just to go, well, let's just go try this. And I knew enough about jet engines and gas turbines to be confident enough to buy one very early stage kind of model aircraft engine. And um, that one first test, uh, you know, you've seen the TED talk with it and the footage, yeah, standing around in a lane with one sort of bolted to an aluminum tube, that was probably one of the biggest leaps of knowledge in the whole journey. Because any sensible engineer would look at it on paper and go, it's gonna consume a ridiculous amount of fuel, it's gonna get really hot, it's gonna be massively dangerous, it's gonna whip around like a fire hose does, obviously, because fire hoses do that, don't they? And with that spindle spinning at nearly 120,000 RPM, it's gonna have such a gyroscopic momentum, like when you spin a bike wheel and hold the spindle, 
you're never going to be able to spin. So you'll need like counter rotating pairs of them and oh my God, this is all pointless. I'm not going to try. On the other hand, go and have a go and realize nearly all of those assumptions are absolute rubbish. And so that was the probably biggest step. And then you saw all the steps beyond that. Over the span of just three years, Richard went from super primitive prototypes to multiple fully functional jet suits. And Gravity is doing more than just building these jet suits. Richard has hired two test pilots, Alex Wilson and Sam Rogers, who help Richard work on and design new suits. Gravity has built a successful business and made a name for themselves by doing some really unique and extraordinary things. In 2017, Richard set the Guinness World Record for fastest speed in a body controlled jet engine powered suit. He hit 32 miles an hour. And then just last month in November of 2019, he shattered his own record and hit 85 miles an hour. Logically speaking here, the risk of injury increases drastically as you climb higher and go faster. Whilst we're pushing boundaries here, we take an attitude of every risk we take has to be recoverable. So jumping over a truck here or whatever, that's about as high as I want to go. Because if I get an engine failure, then it's going to hurt enough, but I'll be okay. It's like falling off a motorbike, right? It's not going to be a great day out. Am I going to go fly over this hangar? I could do. But if I get a failure, I'm not going to be able to have another go, right? I'm not going to be able to keep this journey going. I think it's safe to say that Richard's journey is extremely unique and he's been able to keep going because of how gravity operates as a business. The exploratory approach that has got us to building these things, we apply to the commercial side as well, because there is no rule book of how you make a business out of these things. You know what I mean, there's, but there's obvious things like, you know, doing air shows, doing client experiences. What's ended up happening is that having done some really high-end events, we did something at iconic Mark Zuckerberg's, you know, private office uh, event and stuff. We've done some ludicrous things, opened uh, baseball games in Japan, done car launches in China, Every time we do one, it tends to go on the national media in that country. Everybody goes, oh my God, it's real. It's not just something on, on the internet that's kind of faked. We get a whole extra boost of credibility. And then another wave of people come in and go, could you come to our corporate, you know, we've got a Cisco annual gathering and this is a real one in a month's time, I think. You know, can you come and do a keynote on the innovation journey? And uh, can you come and do a flight demo? And so this is the 95th event in 30 separate countries where we, we or one of my pilots have done events. In what, two years? Yeah. Two and a half years. And that's exactly what the Gravity team was doing in California. The company is based in England and came to this private airport to train clients from all walks of life. So what's next for the future of the jet suits and Gravity as a company? Is there a point, and I mean, you're kind of like, everything you're doing now seems like you're just kind of going with your gut, learning as you're going, right? Yeah. So will these kind of become like can i get one in 10 years and and fly to work in new york versus riding an electric skateboard <laughs> so you know the the honest answer is who knows um the the reality of where we are is that we've done all these events around the world we built a big audience we've really refined the technology to not a bad state we've trained loads of people i mean you've seen you know some people here are pretty much ready to come off the tether by the end of one day it's ridiculous how quick it is to learn i think you know at the end of the day what is the point of this what is the net impact we're having. Well, people kind of lose their minds in a childlike way of seeing a human being fly around. So when you look at something like Formula One or IndyCar or NASCAR, you see vehicles that have not, they're not very practical at all. They don't do much for you, okay? But they massively entertain you, they inspire you, and they push technology. So our plan at the moment is to build a race series. We filmed one already where up to four, five, six pilots are all starting at a sort of, you know, traffic light system, you know, like the drag race lights. Lights go green, everybody hammers off, Put immediately to 40, 50 miles an hour over water, relatively low, so it's safe. Pulling around pylons, if you think like the Red Bull Air Race type format. We're gonna run those, the plan is, around the world in over water in interesting places. So we should have one in Bermuda in March. Uh, and it's the obvious graduation direction. So, you know, you were getting on really well there, right? So with a few more goes, you'd be then over some grass, like three feet over the grass where you've no tether, but you know that at any moment, if you have a wobble, you just flare and you're down straight away, right? A few, a few goes over grass, you're ready to go over water, and then you really can just do what you like to an extent. You still don't want to go really above about 20, 30 feet, but you are completely free. And you can join us, you know, come and race in, in Bermuda. This progression of building these suits, now your attention and focus is developing the racing series yeah, while I, you're doing all this other I, stuff. But because, because as soon as I say mine's faster than yours, you're going to put loads of effort in trying to find ways to go faster than mine. Human spirit is all about competition, yeah? Think of all the evolution that's come out of IndyCar and Formula One, and it's it's... I think that is a wonderful way of supersizing the impact we have on audiences, but also accelerating the technology. Now in parallel, we carry on doing events, we carry on claim, you know, training clients, but also we'll get rapidly towards, back to your point, maybe some technology that is actually more mainstream sensible. 
We built an electric version of this, for instance, and it works. The challenge is that the weight of the batteries means the flight time is kind of crazy. It's like seconds. If that battery technology enhances, then maybe you could have something that will go and take you, uh, you know, in a similar manner to that, right? It doesn't need to, everybody can hear what that is. It doesn't need to take you very high. You could just drift along, you know, at six feet above the ground. You could have a, a, a human enveloping airbag system if there was a problem. And the radar pinging kind of parking sensor technology makes sure you don't go too high or too low. That might well be your modern day scooter replacement. How, how do we get there? We get there by fueling the journey from something like a race series. So that's where Gravity Industries currently stands. They've successfully built multiple fully functional jet packs or jet suits as they're technically called. Richard Browning is a modern day Tony Stark. He's basically a superhero at this point. It's been amazing watching the progression of the company since I first saw the TED talk two and a half years ago. And again, being there in person, seeing this thing in action, is epic. I think going into 2020 and beyond, we'll see Gravity continue refining the suit from a design and functionality perspective, which can increase flight time. They'll dazzle new crowds in more countries and get the racing series underway. Browning is one of the most ambitious people I've ever sat down with, and his drive is really inspiring. So no matter what it is you seek out to do in your lifetime, just know that anything is possible, even human flight. To Richard and the entire Gravity team, thanks for having me out there and thank you for doing everything you do. You've changed my life and many others and I can't wait to fly again.